um, Good evening, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. Here, as I so often am these days with my friend and colleague and co-host, David Wood, who is the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Manchester Center, Vermont. Um, before we get started, a couple of very quick notes. First of all, you may have noticed as you were coming in that um, this event is being recorded for future broadcasts on our YouTube channel. Um, however, we have the settings arranged so that it is only recording um, those of us who are unmuted and in this lovely yellow box. So you, if you have your camera on, will not be recorded for posterity um, and you can have your camera on through the evening. Um, in light of that, if you have any questions for our authors this evening, please use the chat box for those or any comments or any props for, for wonderful readings. Um, please share those in the chat throughout the evening um, and uh, we will be keeping an eye on those and we'll have some time for your questions at the end of the night. Um, and then last of all, a note of thanks to all of you. Um, it's been a long, hard, weird year and a half in the world of independent bookselling. Um, Northshire still exists, and that is really thanks to the incredible support and loyalty of our customers. We couldn't do what we do, including events like this one, without your support, and we are deeply grateful for it. Um, and now, without further ado, David, why don't you take things away and introduce our guest tonight? Oh, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, I've been really excited about tonight. We've got um, two very special poets down from Bennington, uh, up from Bennington, I guess. It's, it's Manchester. Um, first off, we're here celebrating Camille Guthrie's uh, The Launch of Diamonds. She is the author of three previous books of poetry, Articulated Lair, In Captivity, and The Master Thief. Her poems have appeared in such journals as Boston Review, Green Mountain Review, Isle Review, New Republican Tin House, as well as in several anthologies, including the Best American Poetry of 2019 and 2020. Uh, she's been awarded fellowships from the McDowell Foundation and the Yaddo. She's the director of undergraduate writing initiatives at Bennington College. Her newest volume of poetry, Diamonds, has been called a fresh, ribald collection that is all too relatable and unput downable, with a title poem that went viral. Early reviewers have said it's a glorious feminist midlife scream, screed, and ode to the paradoxes and oxymorons of a divorced mother's struggles. With the dark format, formal wit of Larkin and the cutting rage of Plath, Guthrie goes there with hilarious piss and vinegar on the Sisyphean defeats of an academic stranded, a mother burdened, a consumerist broke, a woman who's had enough. Um, <laughs> we are also joined tonight by Mark Wunderlich, author of three previous collections of poetry. He is re recipient of the Lambda Literary Award and has received fellowships from the NEA, the Wallace Stegner Fellowship, Red Loaf, and others. His work has appeared likewise in The Nation, New Republic, New Yorker, Believer, Paris Review, etc. cetera. Um, uh, he's director of the Bennington Writing Seminars and founder of Poetry at Bennington. Uh, his latest volume, God of Nothingness, has been said to make mourning and melancholy tangible, intimate moments through uh, lyric. While well, early reviewers have said that his superb collection disarms with his directness, humor, and pathos. We would also like to give a big thanks to our good friends at the wonderful Yaddo Foundation for their support with this event tonight. And uh, please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Mark Wunderlich and Camille Guthrie. Um, Camille, why don't you start us off? Uh, thank you so much, David. Thank you, Rachel. Many thanks to Northshire Books, a bookstore I adore. And thank you to Yaddo, where I had two blissful weeks in which I drafted most of this book. So this is quite lovely. And I am absolutely thrilled to read with Mark Wunderlich, who's my beloved colleague and friend and whose work I absolutely adore. And this is such a treat. And uh, thank you to all of my friends and family that I see. I'm so pleased to see my parents are here. And Dr. Lloyd, thank you. So I will read three poems from Diamonds. And um, the first um, emerged, I was thinking about the midlife crisis I was going through. And it occurred to me that the corny pun of, of the middle ages, and I thought, well, a midlife crisis would be so much worse if one lived in the actual middle ages when you know your midlife crisis would happen when you were 17 or something and um and that was the 
the kernel of, of this poem. During the Middle Ages. Oh God, I am so fat. I cry all the time. A kitten scrubbed with a toothbrush online makes me sob. I'm so heartless, seven species of bees are now endangered and I didn't do a thing. Didn't even send anybody, any money to anybody doing any good. And I can't lose weight. I skipped yoga. I'm so hot all the time, so broke, so pathetic. No wise investments. I should have bought a 7-Eleven on a busy corner when I was seven or 11. Nobody wants to lick my neck. Nobody wants to hold my hand at the doctor's office. Nobody to grow old with me. I'm so crabby. To pluck, to pluck my beard, feed the cat I don't have, and read me endless Russian novels at night, all the ones I still haven't got to, so greatly depressing. Where are you, handsome? Are you driving in your car to come visit me? bringing a bottle of wine and a present so gallant. A new translation of Agmatova. I love it. No? Well, I guess it's better than living in the real Middle Ages when some shithead priest threatens you with hell to pocket your last coin. And there's no Tylenol, so you have to suck on some skullcap seeds. And knights canter about knocking you down to take your maidenhood with pointy lances. And you have to work as a midwife with no birthing tub. Nobody washes their hands or votes. Nobody knows about DNA or PMS or NASA. There's nothing to read, even if you can read, except boring doctrines <laughs> or spiritual exercises by Gertrude the Great. I'm not kidding. Yes, there is Dante, Chaucer, and some sagas, but it's not like you'd get near those books. You'd be lucky to have some jerk recite the latest by Wolfstan the Cantor by Campfire right before he beheads your uncles and forces you to rub salve on his abs. You know you'd be sweating in a wheat field at 22, dying from your 10th pregnancy by the bailiff. Courtly love, not a lot of it, I bet. Some local doctor would have to drill a hole in my head to let the demons out because I'd be full of black bile plus heresy as I am today. It would be an awfully hard time when the sun revolves around the earth and kings are unbelievably selfish, the Roman empire fell flat, Vikings disemboweled your cousins and the Lord of the manor thinks you're cute. And it'll be a very long time before pop art and meerkat videos and cotton candy and sexting and fish tacos and girl bands. Everything's just so bad and you have boobos. Hopefully I'd get shoved into a nunnery to have an ecstatic experience with mystical Jesus. Or better yet, I could be a hardcore samurai laying down justice on the heads of corrupt lords. But that was tough work, dirty work. You're working for nobility who at any period in history are the worst people in the world. And to be an unemployed Ronin had to bite Sunday afternoons, no mom around to make you soup. Even if all the brothel ladies want to scrub your back, sometimes you just want a nice nap and some neosporin on your wounds. Ah, oh, if only I could be like the divine Say Shonagan, resplendent in silks with seven layered sleeves, writing in my room about politics, gossip, my lovers, listing splendid, awkward, annoying things, things that make one's heart beat faster, I wish. Okay, I could be her devoted servant, tidying her papers and fluffing her pillow. 
but even she found many hateful things about living in the Middle Ages, like crying babies, messy guests, and mansplainers. So irritating, even way back then, you better shut up and take your medicine. I, I wrote that before the pandemic, clearly. Um, I had read it um, somewhere on the internet that Smith College's library has Sylvia Plath's prom dress in their collection. And that seemed to me to be magical. So that's where this next poem comes from. Magical object. It's a little known fact. One of the most magical objects in the world is Sylvia Plath's prom dress. Strapless, white duchess satin, full skirted with a thousand layers of tall and a pleated heart-shaped bodice, I put it on. I put it on to cut an exquisite debutante silhouette because I need its power today. My marriage is over and my youth is gone. I need knowledge, facility, vision, and I don't want to drive into this tree. I zipped up to the back by myself and said, I want to live. Poof, went the dress into a wide circle of vibrating luminous threads. Now I'm flying over my house where icy clouds blow over the roof in a severe white winter sky. The sky is blue on Pluto, I've read. 230 degrees below zero, cold as the hearts of the enemies of poetry. Nothing can pull down the froth of this day collotage as I hitch up the floor length chiffon, my blue ankles peak from the hemline. As I soar over the ice fields of Pluto, nothing can tear apart these radiant waistline seams. Plath knows what I mean. She who lived through the coldest London winter, who wrote at night with chilled fingers and made a rough decision. Her poems thrust from a scorched heart. Her line breaks slice through. I put it on my shoulders point above the glaring satin to hold up the bodice. My breasts fill out the spotless tull propels my body forward. Where are we going now, Plath? What shall I do with your prom queen power? Nobody, nowhere can say. And I'll, then I'll read the title poem. The first idea I had for this poem, Diamonds, came from the fact that I was spending hundreds of dollars buying digital gems for my kids when they were little and playing these games on the phone. That would only be fun if I would buy them, you know, $14.99 of gems to, you know, or gold or diamonds or something. So um, to, to entertain them. <sighs> Diamonds. Judith Butler, I am calling you out. Here in the kitchen where I'm unloading the dishwasher, performing my gender as I'm wont to do. My son yells from upstairs. How do you spell probably? My daughter plays a game on my phone, caring for a little green monster who needs a bath. I need to buy diamonds so her monster can sing. I need a sack of diamonds so I can work part-time and take care of my kids and still eat when I'm old, performing my old lady tasks. I hope I'm yarn bombing an embassy somewhere. Better start learning to knit or whatever. Knitting performs femininity, apparently. We need diamonds to afford my house now that I'm a single mom. 
conflict free ones for a conflict free life. To perform a single mom's gender is to need a chest of gold coins and my life is easy. I am not hungry, not beaten up, working three jobs, taking night classes, not ill without insurance. I have a good job. I'm already leveled up, got all my privileges. I'm not floating on a raft for, to escape war, not having sex with soldiers for food. My children are not digging for diamonds. We're not being exploited in any way. Could be worse is a book we love to read at bedtime. It's by James Stevenson. It is my son and I think the plot to most movies. It is, I think, the plot to most lives. I'm lucky I get to teach you, Judith, to students who eat up your words like candy hearts, who return to the arms of their friends to dye their hair blue and fuck everyone and not shave and make manifestos and tweet witty protests who do drugs and sleep late and dance naked. They seem so unafraid, a historical, dreamful. They stand outside the library, smoking cigarettes as if we're not going to die, as if there aren't books to read. I have the greatest job in the world, could be a lot worse, but I'm lonely, in debt. There's no one to love me. I'm feeling sorry for myself and guilty for all my luck. Mutually contradictory states of mind. That's what Shakespeare invented, supposedly. Gender, you say, is a performance continually created through citational repetition. Daily rituals we put on again and then again as if we were born into a theatrical family putting on the same play that's been going on forever and there's no way out. So says Foucault. Michel, my turtleneck darling, I love you. Although you make me feel imprisoned, docile and subject to self-surveillance. Judith, Michel, I'm calling on you. I think I'm stuck in Hamlet in the role of Queen Gertrude, but not at all royal. I'm from Pittsburgh. Because if I mention any man's name, my son says, I hate that guy. I asked him if he thought I was pretty. He said, eh, you're okay to good. For his birthday, he'd like a BB gun. My daughter spins in the living room to Rihanna, who has a pile of diamonds probably. This little Ophelia talks to her Legos and swims with water wings. She wants to know if music is air. She says my butt jiggles when I walk. Yes, that's it. I am a single Gertrude in a little New England hamlet. Yet there are no louche kings to marry, no murderous uncles available nearby. Yet in the porches of my ear has poured the poison of the wish for reliable love. Marriage is a prison, then is the whole world one? What I want is someone, not a husband, to perform the male gender around my house. I need help stacking wood, putting the garden to bed for the winter I need a man in my bed. It goes way below zero in the winter round here. The garage door is broken. I don't know how to fix it. Better learn to fix stuff, I guess. Like Gertrude, I am the interpreter of the men around me as I put snacks into little plastic bags. And so disciplined plan another play date I play the assuager. I'm afraid of being left with nothing for my future. No castle, no bolt hole on this dirty planet. No extra small bag of gems.
I have unappreciated skills, it's true. I know how to do a close reading. I know where commas go. I can spot phallogocentrism miles away. In my cat glasses, I'm laying it down. Yet I'm terribly lonely, Judith, less lonely than Ophelia floating downstream, clutching flowers and singing sad songs. I want someone to perform love on me, any kind of love, any kind of role, I don't care, but I want the real thing, real love, to be a prisoner of love, the songs say, and to perform all the sex acts too. I want a masterful performance of that with repeat performances. Who's there? I am sitting here folding laundry on the couch performing the pairing of the socks. In anxiety and pleasure, you say. In the porches of my other ear pours the poison of the wish for diamonds. Could be worse. My daughter spins her own tornado. My son builds a house of diamond blocks. I want the curtains to part now. I want to be swept away. Thank you. Um, wow, Camille, what a fantastic reading. And it's so wonderful to be here helping you celebrate the publication of Diamonds and to be able to share this virtual stage with you. It is such a delight to hear you read these poems and it's, it's been so wonderful seeing kind of as this book grew and as, as I started reading these poems in magazines and having it kind of finally coming together into this. So congratulations. And so um, I'm so delighted to, to be here with you. I want to um, begin by uh, thanking uh, Rachel and Daffod for organizing this and everyone at Northshire Books at both of their locations, which we were saying creates a sort of two twin poles of, of literary awesomeness in the North Country. And so I, I hope that you can get to those stores or order books from them because they, they are the best. And I also want to thank uh, the, the Foundation of Yaddo for their sponsorship of this event. And to, of course, to all of you out there who are, are tuning in. And, um, and I, it's so nice to see so many names in this, in the, in the uh, participant group over here whom I recognize. Um, I'm going to be reading from uh, my recent book, although it's every day it gets a little less recent, and um, it's called God of Nothingness, and I'll read some poems from it. Um, uh, the, the book, one of this, the subject of the book is sort of, uh, it's, it's um, uh, in 2018, eight people I was close to died. And, um, and this book uh, kind of takes up uh, some, some of that. It um, has, uh, I, I write, have a number of elegies in this poem. It was also during a time when it, it, it um, uh, we sold the family farm and it, it came to me to kind of make that happen. And in that way, I, you know, became the sort of an end of the line in, in a significant way. And so the book also thinks a little bit about uh, the ways in which I've, I've one sort of grows away from a kind of place of origin. Um, the weather has changed. We're now in cold time, right? It seems like we went from the, the warm half of the year. Now suddenly we find ourselves in the time when we enter into the cold half of the year. Um, this first poem that I'm going to read is kind of about that shift and it's called First Chill. This year, I did not love the first snow, took no joy from the clean whiteness masking the contours of my yard, the last leaves stripped from the weeping beach to reveal its looping undercarriage, the ground hardened underfoot as the world froze in late November. I have secretly admired the first hard frost killing the garden putting an end to its many failures, the beetles and rusts 
finally put to death and which are hard not to see as moral judgments on my insufficient diligence. This year, I put on the woolens, banked the stove with oak and elm, watched the snow feather down on the spruce, the grass still green under white, and I felt an uncommon dread for the inward turn that usually marks these days that end in early nights at home with their firelit contemplations the darkened privacy of the lamp encircling the pages of an open book. I wanted more, not of summer with its swampy air and the nighttime amphibian whir, but of autumn with its metallic skies swept with clouds of the promise of something about to end, but not yet taken away. Above the Catskills, the peaks are veiled in a cloud of snow. This is where I think my dead have gone, my father and Lucy and John, the dead being impervious to cold, having left their bodies with us to cherish, but also to bury and to burn. I imagine them as they wander the high peaks, rippling like figures underwater like figures one dreams and forgets, a shape drawn and erased so only the pencil's impress remains. Now that they are frozen, I know they are truly dead. Let me let them go, I pray to the God of nothingness who rules those icy bluestone peaks, who hides the world of the living underneath his coat of snow. He has taken them from me, and now I will them coldly to go. Um, sex poem is kind of in a similar vein. Uh, it, it sort of precedes the death of my father, but um, it's called Visitation. My mother is alive and funny in the house above the marsh. I think she does not miss my father much as he is still alive though elsewhere. Now that the men and dogs are gone, the team of mules separated and sold off to Iowa and Missouri. Now that we put down the last Labrador, a curly coated giant stinking in the kitchen who loved a tennis ball arcing through the air more than his keeper, more than ducks or food more than rolling in some putrefaction. Now that the yard is quiet, the guns slumbering and locked in their closets, the wild creatures have returned to the yard. The forked horn buck gingers out of the woods to eat the windfall apples. The woodchuck undermines the retaining wall. Bats, squirrels, a coyote printing his mute tracks in a loop around the house, which is now locked in a feminine quiet and where my mother reads, works her puzzles, clicks her needles as she knits another sweater for a baby I'll never meet. I think she likes being unobserved. Husband gone, boys grown up strange and long since moved away. She does as she sees fit. Now it is just the creatures who watch her come and go. Like the bobcat she startled when she stepped out on the porch, who looked up, saw her, and then disappeared into the trees. He left no tracks, no whiff of musk or scat. And so my mother wonders to no one who will hear if the cat was ever really there at all. So a couple of melancholy poems. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of spice things up a little bit with a poem I've, some of you have surely heard me read before, but um, uh, it's one and I will just say that everything in this poem is true. So I'll just sort of leave that, leave that hang in the air before I read it. It's called My Night with Jeffrey Dahmer. My night with Jeffrey Dahmer, like any night spent out in a bar, this one doused in the pink and blue of neon, 1989 for mica and brushed metal, and the spin of sound in the club, 
while downstairs in a darker bar where the older men enjoy each other's company and where I had gone to cool off, a man stood next to me and knocked my beer to the floor. So sorry, he was very sorry hand on my arm as I bent to pick up the bottle, one hand on my arm, the other signaling to the bartender, holding up a finger, then pointing to the empty I proffered, put on the wooden counter bottle, which the keep swept away, replaced a cold green glass already sweating a bit, beating in the heat of the basement. He was a stranger, older than I was by a decade or more, blonde and mustached, big glasses, some farmer's son, a bit out of date, stuck as he was in the country, a man driven into the capital to spend a night among others of his kind, away from his mother's kitchen, the chilled hum of the bulk tank and the cows whose needs were at the center of a life spent in their service. But no, he was from Milwaukee, he said, though to me his words were unimportant. So sorry, let me, I'll get you a new one. Let me buy you one. And so he took out his wallet and handed over his dollars. And I suppose I looked to see if he had left a tip since I always look for this, having done already the work of service in which you depend on the manners and guilt and sense of custom of those you attend, their generosity, their goodness, their notion of what is normal and right, what to offer to others in exchange for their help, their attentiveness here. Let me buy you a beer. So sorry for my clumsiness. Let me put this hand on your arm. Do you live here? Are you at the university? Do you like the music? Did I tell you my name? His questions, the questions of any curious man talking to a farmer's son in a bar in Madison, Wisconsin, asking my name, which I withheld, my name, which I kept lodged between my teeth, under my tongue, in the pocket of my clavicle, in the scar on my eyebrow, in my belly, in the sack of my scrotum, in my head, my hand, my arm, which he touched lightly, my mouth, my teeth, my tongue, which began to move, unlock, give up its wariness, give in to say, my name is Mark, what's yours? Um, this next poem that I'll read is, uh, it'll maybe, of this one and maybe one short one. Um, this one is called Death of a Cat. Little beast on the metal table. She took the needle into her forepaw and didn't flinch. The medicinal death fit itself in hide inside her, ran the blue and red map burned up into her lungs and brain and heart, which slowed and she slept until there was no breath left and her body emptied itself of air. A little blood showed at the nose and as her warmth left, her lungs and throat rattled a little, which was the sound of the earth taking back the quickness it had lent her. 11 years had passed inside her body all of them as my companion, having found her as a kitten shut up in a cage. These are the years during which I have lost a great deal while the cat watched in her dumb way, unburdened by the need to assign language to everything she sees. A man I loved left and the household we built together became a private realm populated by my singularity the paper city of my books, and by this cat who patrolled the 32 corners of the house. She occupied the place in my absence and my presence, eating and licking her paws, shedding her undercoat as winter folded back into spring, and insects and stray bats returned as fodder for her games of cruelty. She knew nothing of my nephew, and the noose he slipped around his neck, leaning forward while seated on the floor, 
until the life was strangled from him and he was found among his store of guns, a long knife, the tight black clothing that he wore. Outside Portland kept winding past with its bicycles and beer, pretty bridges spanning a river whose name I don't even know, a city image of perpetual immaturity fixed like a young man strained against a rope. Hope didn't live there with him in the clabbered house he shared. And for some time, it didn't live with me either. The cat didn't mind, winding behind the wood stove in the fall, when the first cold night sent me to split some kindling and warm the old stones of the hearth. She didn't care about anything other than herself. And in this, there was perfection to eat and sleep, to find amusement in the hunt, to seek out the slant of sunlight where it warmed the clean pine floors, and to meet me when I came home in a way that resembled love. How she came running, hearing my key turn the tumblers of the lock, even though I had trained her to link the sound of my arrival with the food I would spill into her bowl. There was bliss in this, to be met by a body at the door, to be joined at night in a bed, her head within my reach, inside which no words tumbled, no reasoning wrecked the morning, no memory bound the missing to my single body left lying nightly in the bed. In the morning, I rise up and go out into the world forgetting whatever images flickered through the dim chambers of house or brain, bed and book and hearth, the smoke rising up from the stove embers, which in the morning chill and with my black tools, I stir back into warming life. And I'll end with one short poem a request. This one is called Ha Ha Little Hunchback. Ha ha little hunchback, look at him, pretend to trip teeth in his pocket, ring the doorbell three times and make the children clap. He taught me to run the bandsaw and run the chainsaw, cut a key from a blank key, how to break into a car through the window without breaking the window. He fixed slot machines and gumball machines, made mechanical decoys with pulleys and weights. Der stehst du, Bub, he'd ask and I'd nod, but I usually didn't understand the little hunchback. At nine, I couldn't drive, so he taught me to drive. We'd cruise the corn stubble with the noses of our midget guns poked out the windows of the Jeep. His, the Black Prince, mine, Little red fox blocks on the pedals so both of us could reach. We'd shoot squirrels and we'd shoot roughed grouse. And when I shot a pheasant cock, he had the feathers made into a fancy band for a hat. Good enough for who it's for, he'd say, tapping in a crooked carpentry nail. He made his money in moonshine sugar, made his money making bad luck loans, hired a giant everyone called Tiny. Then he became Tiny's home. His teeth pinched so he didn't wear them. His idea of a lady's gift was a meat slicer he knew she'd have to wash. But who wouldn't want to ponder a moon of pink bologna slipped fresh into an outstretched palm? As a child, he'd hitch up his angry pony and beat it all the way to the train to fetch the bales of tobacco and haul them to the shop. If he dawdled and was late, Grandpa Adolf would unbuckle his wooden leg and leave it napping on a chair, then beat his little hunchback with a cane. Little hunchback, little hunchback, never you be late again. Thank you, everyone. So we have time for some audience questions and audience, please type anything that you would like to ask into the chat. Um, Camille and Mark, there's been a ton of love for your readings in the chat. Um, everyone's really been enjoying um, everything that you've shared tonight. It's been quite amazing. And I would love to kick the questions off while we're waiting for audience members to type with a question since Yado, you know, was our great supporter in marketing this event. 
Um, would either of you or both of you like to speak a little bit about your experience at Yaddo and, and what retreats mean to writers? Camille. Um, first of all, Mark, thank you. That was uh, stunning and chilling and um, wicked and um, devastating. I never, ever get over the pink moon of baloney. It's just my favorite line. It's so exquisite. I don't know how you write in such a, uh, with such clarity and that you have such dense sound texture all the time. I loved it. Thank you for that. Uh, Yado, so, um, Yaddo was a big deal for me. It was my first writer's residency and I had two weeks. I decided I could be away from my children for two weeks. I visited them three times during <laughs> those two weeks because it was an hour away from my home. I felt so guilty. It was the most wonderful time because I could just um, sit in my room and write these poems, I decided to write fearlessly. So it was a, um, a life-changing moment for me. And um, I was also um, in love. I had fallen in love, which was a big surprise. And I had um, a lot of feelings. And, um, and we one is totally spoiled at Yaddo. So it was it was just an incredible moment to be taken care of and um, for a mother to be cooked for was incredible. And I met um, brilliant people there. So for me, it was the um, the place where I imagined this book, and um, I decided I remember drafting the title poem Diamonds There. And I thought, well, I'm just going to um, say all the embarrassing things that I'm thinking, and then I will edit the hell out of it until it becomes a poem. And, and it did. So I think of it as a, a magical place. Um. I'm so I'm so glad you got you had that time there, Camille, so that we got that poem. So that's uh, that that's that's really something. And of course, what these what these places do is is you know I mean it's it's um, is they provide the idea of sort of excluding distraction and of kind of warding off the world a little bit so that you can do something, make an experiment and do something new. I've actually never been a resident at Yaddo, so uh, though I have served on the jury, um, I, I've, I've sort of participated, offered service and been to uh, lovely dinners there and things like that, but I've never been a, been a fellow there. I have had equivalent experiences at other places and they are these, these, I'm so glad that, you know, um, um, places like Yaddo and McDowell and Chivitella Ranieri and the James Merrill House and the Fine Arts Work Center and, you know, these, that these entities exist that, that are trying to create circumstances in which work can be made. Um, the hardest thing that I've found in my, you know, it, it's, it's not that I'm, I'm distracted all the time. It's just that I have a lot of responsibilities <laughs> and that, you know, there's a lot of, of ways in which my mind is always trying to kind of figure out which, which thing I need to attend to. And so the idea of these colonies is they're so precious because they give you permission to go to them and say like, I have this time, this is what I'm here to do. I'm not here to do these other things. And so they make work like that possible. And a long, complex, funny um, poem, like your title poem in this, in, in your book is the kind of thing that is born out of that experience, which, you know, isn't fragmented. It's not bro broken up. It's not being in, in, you know, I mean, the world is always out there on the edges, you know, trying to get in kind of like a, a squirrel trying to get into your attic, but it's there, but it, you can kind of keep it out for a while. So I'm, I'm eternally grateful to all places like Yaddo. <laughs> Um, thank you both again for that reading. I, I, I absolutely loved it. But I, I've got a question for both of you, as, uh, for, for, for you, Camille. And can you tell us a little bit about your research, particularly in, in medieval stuff, where that, that first... 
<laughs> okay, well, uh, confession. I When I had that idea of writing about the Middle Ages, I decided that I wouldn't do any research, that I would remember everything I could think of from the Middle Ages, which probably came from Monty Python movies, right? And, um, and the plague, right? The buboes. And then, you know, I'm a slow writer. So I, I, I re rewrite the poems and revise endlessly. So at some point I cheated and I went to, but I decided only Wikipedia. I'm not going to read real historical books about medieval times because I find that when I do, I, I just get so many ideas. I can't stop adding things. So, so when I went to Wikipedia, I found cool things like Gertrude the Great, who was a real person who wrote spiritual exercises, and Wolf Stan the Cantor, who apparently was a real bard at that time. And I loved the name so much I had to include them. And, you know, and, and, the, and then of course, I love the writer say shown again i love the pillow book it's one of my favorite books and she writes in such a witty um gossipy brilliant way she sound you know in translation she sounds like a contemporary so when i thought of that time you know that would be the it made me think of that joke, you know, um, in my before life, I was this person, you know, everyone chooses someone famous. And, and I thought, oh, wouldn't it have been cool to be her friend or be her servant or something, you know, just, just be sort of close to her in, in some proximity. So I brought her in as well, um, because many of the poems like Diamonds apostrophize writers that I love like Judith Butler, or or Foucault or apostrophized texts that I love like Hamlet. Um, so I, I broke my first rule, but I, I, didn't, um, I didn't go too deep. I thought it, it wouldn't fit the tone of the poem, which was meant to sound like a, a dramatic monologue. Thanks, Camille. Um, I've got a question for you both, uh, another one, and that is, can you talk a little bit about you know, how your writing process was affected by um, the pand pandemic? Oh. Um, well, let's see. Um, first of all, I just want to say that, that uh, you know, it, it's, it, that we were, everyone was, was affected and, and we're still being affected. And we're still, you know, the reason we're all here on on our little screens is because it's it's still going, you know, it's still it's still with us, and it's evolving and changing. I hope improving, but here here we are. Um, and I I guess I would preface it by saying that it, um, you know, my my life um, in many ways was sort of un. Uh, unaffected. I didn't lose anyone and I didn't get sick and, you know, and I'm, and I kept my job and, you know, all of those things I was grateful for. I guess the thing, you know, the thing that did happen is that I just worked all the time. And the, the divisions that I used to have between work life and personal life were, were eroded so quickly. And, and I also just became incredibly ambitious. I think one of the things that I did during the pandemic, which has evolved into further writing and which I'm really kind of grateful for, is when I was teaching at Bennington at the on at the at the being I, I was supposed to be teaching a seminar on on the German language poet writer Maria Rilke in the fall of 2020. And we were given these options to figure out how we wanted to teach. Is it all Zoom? Is it asynchronous? Is it, you know, how you want to do it? And I I, because it's Bennington and because you can do these sort of things, I said, I want to teach the entire class through the mail. I want to write letters to my students and then I want my students to write back. And I don't want to Zoom and I want us all to write circular letters to each other that sort of move around that people send one to the next. And I wanted us to kind of read these things together and then 
and then respond deeply in writing to each other. And that was my notion. Um, and, uh, and so I started doing that and I found what I did is I just wrote these like essays about this work that I really love. And I don't know that I would have done that if that circumstance hadn't, hadn't brought itself. And now this has become part of a nonfiction book that I'm working on writing about, um, writing about Rilke and writing about reading the Duino elegies during a year when, when uh, eight people I knew died. Right, so that that became it, and so also part of that book is going to be the correspondence that I had with my students. I then, you know, somebody I just tweeted something about it, and I received. It's not an exaggeration. A thousand queries from people asking me how they could take that class, and so I offered it kind of publicly. And a thousand people did not take the class. I had to sort of cap it, but nearly a hundred did. And I continued writing these letters about this to people and sending, sending them weekly, you know, writing this. I, that's, that was what I did during the pandemic. It is the thing that I have to show for this time. It sort of reflects my isolation and my love of this work, but also my engagement with it. So that's something that I did, but I wanna hear about Camille. Oh my God, Mark, that is incredible. I cannot wait to read this book about Rilke and your class. And that's extraordinary that a thousand people wrote you to take the class. How amazing. I love to think of you in your house sending off a hundred letters with, with Rilke, with, with a letter about Rilke. What, it's, that's just incredible. Um, well, so many things come to mind. Um, like Mark, I. I am very lucky because um, we did not get sick and um, I live in rural Vermont, which was a, a very safe place to be and is a safe place to be um, during the pandemic. And I was able to teach on Zoom and, um, and I'm also an introvert. So it was a, a, a time that wasn't hard for me to adjust to actually and I, um, read a lot of books. Uh, I read Alice Munro for the first time. I don't know why it took me 50 years to discover Alice Munro, but it was incredible um, experience, artistic experience for me to read her and um, all of Octavia Butler's books as well. Just absolutely devastating artist. And um, so uh, a quiet time at home reading um, that said, so many devastating things have gone on um, since I wrote Diamonds. I wrote Diamonds before Trump, before the pandemic. And I find that um, when I try to write about these very difficult things, um, my, it's like an inarticulate you know, screen. So I'm, I think it will take me some time to know how this, um, devastating period affects my writing. I think um, like a lot of us, I'm, I'm just trying to get through it, right? And um, protect and um, surround people I, I love with care. I, um, but I also know that over that time, I started doing a dance aerobics class called Pony Sweat, which I recommend to everyone I know, and everyone here, I hope you will look up Pony Sweat because the teacher of it is the, one of the most lovely, cheerful people I've ever seen. And she changed my teaching life. She, her um, motto is to practice anti-perfectionism. So she plays great music and you dance around like a fool and get some exercise and get out of your head. And she, all, her other motto is F the moves. So I brought that cheerful, loving energy to my classes and on Zoom, and it changed my sense of teaching to be one of anti-perfectionism and joy. And I, I think it's a very political thing to, to um, think about joy and care 
as a kind of resistance. And um, I am just finishing Miriam Tabe's new book, Fight Night, which I also highly recommend. And in it, the grandmother character who is unforgettable writes about joy as resistance. So that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> Thank you, Camille. And yes, Fight Night is great. Um, there is one question, more question uh, I received, I was DM'd from uh, Carol in the chat and she asked, Camille, if you could give a few more details about how you decided to approach your poems fearlessly. 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 Um, well, um, let's see. I think I decided to um, practice the old feminist dictum that the personal is political. So, um, and to um, embrace embodiment, right? This is what, this is what we talk about in, when we teach feminist theory. And um, so I decided to include things like, um, uh, you know, how I was feeling about my body or the daily things that I was doing or things that I was overhearing and to, um, when you write the, the lyric poem, the lyric poem is a very kind instrument to elevate one's personal experience, right? Because it sets the eye, it sets the person on this, this huge stage. And so the um, one's uh, feelings, one's daily life become these um, huge concerns, right? These big poetic concerns. And so I thought um, one of the ways I would do that was to use poetic forms. So there are several uh, sonnets in the book. Um, there's a sestina, there are some apostrophes, there's some dramatic monologues. And I felt, well, I have all of these messy, uh, ugly, difficult feelings, but if I shove them into a poetic form, they will have structure. And it, the restraint of it will help me organize them and, and understand them. And then I can also play with the form and subvert it. So that was one method I had to try to be fearless and brave was to depend on poetic form as a kind of um, uh, stabilizer um, uh, through the difficult time I was going through. And so, and then it becomes technically pleasurable. So one can write about very um, difficult things, but the, the pleasure of revision and the sound devices and, um, and meeting the form in its traditions takes over. Wonderful. Um, Camille and Mark, this has been such a wonderful evening, but unfortunately we are just about out of time and we need to wrap things up. Um, I could listen to the two of you talk all night long. But thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time to be with us here tonight. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Thank you, thank you so much, Mark. Congratulations, Camille. Thank you. Congratulations to you, Mark. Thank you. It's so lovely to see you all. Thank you for coming. Audience, thank you so much for being here. You can order um, both authors' books at markchair.com. And while you're there, you can check out other great upcoming events that we have. We have events pretty much every week, including um, coming up in November. We'll be hosting a, another poetry reading for um, former Northshire bookseller uh, who's just published her debut, Devin Walker Figueroa. And Mark will actually be back with us that night. So come on back and join us for another great reading. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful night. Thank you.